The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Seeds of Wellbeing series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, or funders, and any affiliated organizations involved in this project. Welcome to a Seeds of Wellbeing Voices from the Field podcast featuring voices of Hawaii agriculture producers for Hawaii agriculture producers. These podcasts are made possible by a grant from the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, also known as CTAR, and the Seeds of Wellbeing, or SO project, and is supported by a grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Aloha mai kako. Welcome back to another podcast episode of the Seeds of Wellbeing, Voices from the Field. My name is Alex Wong. I am working with the University of Hawaii CTAR, College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, Seeds of Wellbeing Project. And I'm here today with Dr. Harold Kaiser, who is previously the University of Hawaii CTAR's Maui County Administrator. Aloha, Dr. Kaiser. Mahalo Aloha, for joining Alex, us. How are you? Good, how are you today? Doing very well, thanks. Doing very awesome. Well. well, let's jump right into this conversation because you have a lot of information to share from all of your experience working with ag producers in the islands. Um, first question. So uh, pesticides came up as one of the top five stressors in our Seeds of Wellbeing Ag Producers Survey that we conducted in 2021 and 2022. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why you think that is the case. Why pesticides? is at the top of the list and things that are stressing out our local ag producers. Okay, well, thanks. Um, I guess overall, my take is that uh, it would be a stressor because um, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation that's um, out there. Um, and it's been a concerted effort, I think, over several years. And it, um, you know, it's easier, I would say, it's easier to scare people than to educate them. And, um, you know, one of the, um, probably one of the initial things that got me interested in this, because my background, I was a soil scientist, soil microbiologist, uh, but in my role as Maui County Administrator, you know, uh, one, of our, one of my obligations was to provide um, evidence-based information to the public. And um, at that time, uh, this was several years ago, uh, when there was a lot of um, misinformation about pesticides and GMOs, uh, the mayor of Maui asked, asked me um, to assist with providing you know, education to the public using evidence-based information. Um, and that's when I started getting into it in detail. Um, and yeah, it, it became clear pretty quick that um, the information that was getting out there uh, was, was very narrow. And it was focused um, just on hazards, right? Not on the written, not on ways you can mitigate the hazard to make it an acceptable risk. And um, like I said, you can scare people easily. But we live with hazards every day. You know, you think of electricity, you know, driving a car, power tools. These are all things that are dangerous, hazardous, but we learn how to mitigate that uh, to an acceptable risk. And the same thing is true with pesticides. Um, you know, the, um, there's, there's a lot of information about, you know, scaring people with uh, that, all oh, these restricted use pesticides or, you know, poisoning the islands. Well, you know, that's gonna stress people out. <laughs> and, they, you know, and they say, well, you know, are they imply, there's been a lot of implications, oh, you know, just poisoning the islands. Well, you have to take this in perspective. I mean, re restricted use pesticides, for instance. The number one restricted use pesticide in the nation, in the state and in the county is chlorine. 
and it's pumped right into our domestic water supply to make it safe to drink. And it's, it's regulated by EPA and they recommend up to four parts per million um, even in the delivery uh, system, you know, up to your home, up, you know, up to where, you know, you're getting that water from. So here's a pesticide that's almost everyone <laughs> uh, gets exposure to every day. Uh, and it's been injected into the water that we drink, cook, and bathe with, right? And, but at safe levels. At, at very low levels that um, make our water safe so we don't get sick. Uh, and I think, um, get, you know, getting out information like this and that it's also used in our uh, sewage treatment systems so we don't have a lot of disease organisms being spread all over. Um, and um, I mean, it's, it's used in so many things. Um, it's even used in jet fuel for airliners, <laughs> so that does so uh, fungicides put in so that it doesn't clog up uh, the fuel filters, which which you don't want to have happen. But anyway, um, yeah, I get, I think uh, as a farmer, um, somebody in agriculture, you know, if if you constantly hear this drum beat that oh, all all pesticides are poisons. Um, and that it's ruining our environment and our health, you know, that could definitely be a stressor, but it's taken out of context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, 500 years ago, the, uh, the fellow who invented toxicology, um, his name was uh, Paracelsus. He's one that came up with, um, he looked and looked and he, he, found, he found out that almost everything at the correct dose is a poison. You know, water, you can take too much water. <laughs> um, anything at the, at the uh, proper dose though, is a poison. I think he, he said it's the dose that makes the poison. Mm -hmm. You look at Botox, people inject it into their face. Well, Botox comes from botulinum uh, toxin, which is the most. Uh, toxic substance known to man. And so you think, well, why would anybody inject that into their face? Well, as a concentrated form, it's really, it's deadly, really deadly. But if you dilute it and keep diluting it, you know what? It, in, instead of telling your brain as a neurotoxin to turn off your lungs or your heart, you know, it tells your it tells your wrinkles to you know puff up a bit so that you know <laughs> you don't see these lines. So I guess what I mean my point is that um, you know risks are different from hazards, mm -hmm. and um, I think you know that there's been uh, too much emphasis on um, the hazards pesticides, which get mitigated by risks, and also having in perspective, um, you know, the history of pesticide use. Uh, the, you know, beef, EPA was formed in 1970. And before that, pesticides were regulated in different departments. They got consolidated then. And that was the first time that um, it came under one roof and the agency said from, you know, as a result of public uh, perception and public um, emphasis that um, they're going to regulate pesticides by safety, and they they did a very good job. Within the first six to eight years, the average toxicity of pesticides just dropped dramatically because they told the producers, "Okay, we we know which ones are the bad actors, and we're not going to re-register them, re-register them," and so. They had to get rid of them or they're going to be banned and it worked out well and over the years um, since epa started regulating pesticides not only has the toxicity dramatically dropped but the use rate uh, that they use in the field has about been cut in half and the the persistence in the soil the half-life of the uh, average pesticides in the soil has dropped and so um you know, when you look at it in perspective, 
uh, pesticides have gotten uh, a lot safer than they were. You know, during the um, during World War II, when they had Victory Gardens in Hawaii, CTAR even published a uh, really nice publication on home gardening in Hawaii, how to feed a family of four, um, depending on your elevation, which side of the island you are, um, the frequency with which you'd plant vegetables to feed. Oh, yeah, it was really good. Well, the, the chapter on uh, pest control, the recommendations included you know, dusting with a lead arsenic, for instance, and a few, and a few other things. lead. Well, lead arsenic. At the time, 1943, <laughs> that was accepted, you know. And, it, you know, they, they had a little bit of caution. They said, you know, uh, when you read the chapter, it says um, that this is, uh, you know, toxic, so be careful. <laughs> We've come a long now, way, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, uh, pesticides are much more highly regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to go through more than a hundred, some estimates are 120, 140 tests uh, that they have to submit that are data that has to be submitted along with uh, application to EPA to have a pesticide approved. Um, and that gets uh, EPA reserves the right to, be, you know, to restrict that at any time, but they've gotten so much safer. Um, and they're just, uh, they're, you know, when you look at how they're used uh, and the benefits from them, um, you, you know, it, it makes you understand more. And I think um, understanding things makes them less scary. Well, that, that's, that's the tricky part is, it's easier to, like you said, to scare somebody using words like poison than it is to hand somebody a 400 page document and say, here you go, here's the data, here's the evidence. Yes, <laughs> yes. That is, yes, that, that is the challenge um, to present it in any you know, form that most people, you know, have enough time and uh, you're not dealing in acronyms and, mm -hmm. you know, Explain these and, things and, and the chemistry behind it too is it's high level it's very high level and it's not it's definitely something that somebody without you know with just a high school diploma you know educational background like somebody like that would have a hard time digesting that and understanding what they're reading right so being yeah, able to translate the science to the general public, you know, in terms of public perception, that's tricky. Um, I think also the transparency is, it's hard to translate. I mean, the fear, like, if, if we were to draw a connection to like, say the pharmaceutical industry and to be able to parse out, you know, the, that corporate industrial complex with our, with our government that's so closely tied with money and lobbying and all that, um, it can get very convoluted. So is the only path forward education, is, is there any simpler way of kind of, and this is this brings me to my second question, like how would you describe the current state of pesticide usage and public and private perceptions in Hawaii? Um, I mean, we've come, like, like you said, we've come a long way. We've definitely crossed certain chemicals and certain things off of the list. I mean, we've definitely come pretty far from the Rachel Carson Silent Spring uh, DDT era, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where where do you do you do you feel like like now in 2023, um, the public perception has gotten better? I mean, I, I've been on Kauai for the last uh, seven years now, and um, when I first moved there, there was is still very much a hot topic. You know, the, mm -hmm. the whole anti-GMO, um, even the county of Kauai, the, the council members tried to pass their own ordinances, their own laws to ban pesticides. And, you know, they were overruled in the state Supreme Court. Um, have, have, has anything changed since that, that era about a decade ago of this whole um, shift in public perception and, and the fear of pesticides and talking about this whole, this whole issue? Well, I, th I think it has, uh, you know, somewhat abated in the 
you know, in the you know general public awareness, because yeah, like as you said, that there was a period there where both on Kauai and Maui, um, there was a lot of um, activity about around getting, you know, lumping GMOs and pesticides and just banning them, or you know, yeah. Um, you don't hear as much about it, but um, you know, the, I think the perception is still there that um, yeah, we should do whatever we can to avoid use of pesticides. Um, and you know, as as to your uh, your other observation about you know what can we do besides education? Um, yeah, it uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a complicated subject, and to uh, uh, for instance, to try and show people that you know how much safer pesticides have become, um, and that um, we have we have things in our medicine cabinet that are <laughs> that are even that are more toxic, you know, um, than pesticides, you know, including aspirin, including caffeine, you know, and trying to explain what toxicity is. Uh, it, it's a long conversation, but um, you know, there are there ha there has to be a certain amount of trust in in organizations like EPA, USDA, World Health Organization, the European Union, uh, you know, and they've all looked at this. Some of the best experts in the world uh, in detail, um, you know, and you know, have pretty much come up with, um, come up with the same conclusions that, you know, when, when properly used, pesticides um, you know, are not unduly unsafe. So for, for our listeners' edification, um, if you could just real quick um, explain the difference between organic pesticides and non-organic pesticides. And when I say organic, I'm talking about like the labels, the little seal of approval, like mm -hmm. like signed off by like Omri or any sort of third party um, agency that has been given the ability to put their little symbol on a on a product. Um, what the difference is is one safer than the other? Um, the the usual. If if you can please uh, um, elaborate a little bit. Yeah, the um, the uh, that program, the OMRI and Certified Organic, that's under the um, coordination of USDA. And um, and then they collaborate with EPA because uh, every, every pesticide um, has to be registered with EPA. These uh, organic OMRI approved pesticides, um, if if they're a natural product, if they're derived from a natural source, a lot of them are derived from plant extracts. Uh, you know, and ones you'd be familiar with would be known or um, the copper salts, which have been used for you know centuries on uh, for fun as a fungicide in the wine is wine grape industry. Um, if they're natural, they can be shown to be natural products. They don't have to go through as these, you know, many hundreds of tests that synthetic compounds do. But they can be, they can be just as toxic. Um, and if, um, if not applied correctly, right? If not applied, if, yes. If, if not applied correctly, yes. Any of them um, can be toxic uh, at the right dose. And yeah, if not applied correctly. So um, in, in there, I think th there's probably f many fewer options um, um, for certified organic use. Uh, but they, like I said, they tend to use either natural uh, mineral or uh, plant-based products. Uh, and you'll see that uh, on the uh, label. Mm -hmm. On a non-organic, like they, um, they have to, Go through much more extensive testing, but yeah, natural products <laughs> like Botox, <laughs> I mean botulinum toxin, uh, rotenone, 
these, uh, you know, it's, it can be user unfriendly. Uh, you know, you get it on your skin or, you know, enough exposure to it. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, anything can be toxic. Yeah, so the main takeaway is even if it's organic, if it's not used correctly, it's still right. poison, right? Right, right. and um, I, I should say that, you know, one of the best ways um, to de-stress about all this is becoming familiar with what's called the worker protection standard, uh, whether it's for homeowners or organic producers, or conventional ag producers. The worker protection standard uh, is what EPA put out uh, in 2017. And it's, uh, when they say worker protection standard, they're talking about for, agric for commercial agricultural workers. Um, if, you know, if you produce, um, if you're a farmer, greenhouse grower, nursery grower, um, and you use pesticides, and they have these are new and revised rules because they, they, that focus on the worker, right? And they have uh, uh, the many, many regulations, many record keeping requirements, training or annual training requirements. And it really um, is probably the best information available about how to use, how to safely use pesticides to protect yourself to protect the environment. And it's really, it, it, you can, um, uh, there's a site uh, from the, the Pesticide Education uh, Collaborative Resources. You can look at all the uh, information there, the videos, uh, you know, the original training videos that are required for all pesticide workers and handlers um, at agricultural establishments. But the worker protection standard, uh, you know, really addresses what you're talking about is that uh, whatever pesticide it is, you know, what the personal protection equipment has to be for a given product, um, you know, all the, you know, all the variables about when to apply it, um, how to read the label correctly, um, you know, and how to uh, notify others um, that a pesticide has been applied, not to go into that area for a certain amount of time, how to dispose of the, uh, the pesticide container. It, it's quite comprehensive uh, program. And EPA developed it specifically focusing on the uh, workers because they, they realized, I mean, that's, that's where the real exposure is. Not, I mean, uh, drift and um, public exposure is very minor. I mean, and, and you can imagine, um, you know, the, the most hazardous uh, point with handling um, pesticides is, is in a concentrated form. So when you're mixing it, you know, and uh, handling it. So they, uh, they focus a lot on, on uh, the handler safety. Use the proper PPE, right, always? Oh, yes, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, uh, there's been a lot of studies done, um, and gosh, it's, it's in the, I'd have to look, but like 80, 90% of the exposure comes, you know, from your hands up to your elbow. Mm. And so, okay, the smart thing to do is you wear chemical, chemical resistant gloves mm -hmm. all the time, you know, even, even if, I mean, the label is the minimum and yeah, the, the label will say on it what the personal protection equipment requirement is. And uh, even if it doesn't require gloves, you should wear gloves <laughs> because if you're using it routinely, well, that increases your exposure. But if you've got chemical resistant gloves, that really helps. Mm -hmm. And also uh, face protection because, you know, after your hand, then, you know, eyes and your face. And probably um, there's really good information on that also um, from in the, it's called the Ag Health Study. And the Agricultural Health Study, uh, it's, a thir it's now in its, about its 30th year, uh, is a study that uh, coordinated by EPA, OSHA, uh, National Cancer Institute, 
And they uh, basically have looked at a cohort of, I think it's in the 80,000 pesticide, registered uh, pesticide applicators in the US. This has been going on for 30 years. And you know, they enroll the people, they get information yearly on what products they use, uh, how much, what their exposure has been, and they follow them through their life. Uh, and it's a tremendous study that's, um, you know, hundreds of publications have come out of it because they're looking for, um, you know, what are the biggest risks, right, for pesticide users. And, um, you know, one, one of the big things that always shows up is that gloves matter, right? Uh, and using the proper PPE, you know, is essential. So uh, that brings me to jumping ahead to one of my questions, um, which you, I think you started touching on is, who is responsible for recording and publishing pesticide-related injuries, deaths, and health effects in the state of Hawaii? Is, is there any um, agency that, like, if, if they hear of a farmer or an ag producer passing away of cancer or some, some illness, that could potentially be correlated to their profession or their occupation. Um, who who follows up with that family uh, to to document, you know, the potential statistic there? Um. Well. Yeah, I I must say I'm not sure the exact Hawaii you know uh, rule on that, but uh, any pesticide violation. Uh, go would go start with the uh, pesticide branch uh, of um, Department of Ag, and the, and they they have they have to inspect incidences of uh, any public complaint, right, uh, in each county, mm -hmm. and if there were um, um, serious injury, I'm sure they would uh, either bring in a Hawaii. Hiosh, um, you know, the Hawaii Office of Safety um, or uh, uh, Public Health Department. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if there's been, but yeah, it would first be the uh, pesticide branch. Now, um, somewhat related, you know, you mentioned on, uh, yeah, Kauai a few years ago, um, there was um, several, um, People in the, uh, from the general public who were concerned that there had been, um, you know, uh, larger incidences of cancer than th that there should be uh, cancer clusters in Kauai, and they uh, were claiming that it, well, they were saying it could be related to the large ag industries there, and um, the uh, the Department of Health and uh, um, has a, uh, well, the University of Hawaii Medical Center, uh, Cancer Center, and the Department of Health. I think it was called the Tumor Registry Division. Uh, they got together to address those concerns. Um, and they didn't find any. But, um, to, yeah, to your question, the, uh, if, if there's a serious, um, if there were a serious accident causing death, um or, or, or serious injury uh, it would be first uh, the pesticide branch and as uh, probably department of health and uh, yeah. okay so just for everyone's edification those would be the agencies to refer oh, yeah. to yes yeah yeah they uh the, you know it, as i mentioned epa regulates pesticides um, for registration, they're the uh, national authority, um, but they give the state the authority to carry out um, the um, enforcement of that and to add even more regulation if they want to. Okay. Um, I, I do have another question. We're jumping around a little bit, but um, to stay on the pesticide topic, um, so you were a co author of a 2018 publication, the Hawaii Pesticide Policy and Law Review Project. So mm -hmm. I was wondering what were the recommendations made as a conclusion 
to that publication, that project. And since 2018, have any of the recommendations been implemented? Have, have we moved forward? Have, have you know, and, and to, I'm sure the 2018 publication was probably, you know, in light or related to the whole uh, public um, interest, right? Growing interest in this whole topic of conversation. So I was wondering if anything's changed since 2018. Um, yeah, so in, uh, in that report, um, you know, we, we looked at, you know, Hawaii's, um, uh, we look, uh, regulation structure, the rules, uh, requirements, and compared them to, uh, a few states similar in size, like, um, Oregon, Vermont, and some others, and, um, you know, per, um, Hawaii uh, it was very equivalent in, in many respects um, to the other states uh, in terms of, you know, when you compare it on a per capita basis uh, on uh, the Department of Agricultural budget devoted to pesticide regulation, those things. Um, and, um, yeah, we basically concluded, you know, we also looked at all the uh, environmental studies have been done and as, as i related before it's gotten um you know there's been studies on pesticides in the water and uh you know drinking water as well as um in groundwater and these studies again have all gotten um over the years especially after the plantations have gone out things have gotten much better and um very little hardly anything above very small, um, you know, detectable amounts have been found, and the recommendations for improvement that we um, provided in there was to help clear, uh, emphasize in clarifying the new rules. For instance, um, uh, at that time, this is 2018. At that time, they just put in uh, the legislature just passed new regulations about setback distances from the schools, right? And uh, so, and and from other facilities, um, and it wasn't clear at that time, you know, information about how people were going to find out about this. A lot of recommendations were on okay for farmers, um, you know, letting them know how and where they had to do this. Um, also in um, recommendations to uh, provide information to all the schools, all the DE, DOE facilities uh, about um, their use of uh, pesticides. You know, that there, there should be real clear policies about that. Um, you you and, mean on, ca on campus and yes. at K through 12 yes. schools, yes. Right. Uh, ma maintenance and facility uh, personnel. Mm -hmm using right. pesticides for, for weed control, herbicides or whatever, right? For cleaning, yeah, for cleaning products. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, since that time, um, there, there has been clarification uh, and, and more administrative rules on uh, making it clear. Um, one, one thing that, uh, we don't, that we also did recommend was, for instance, that's, hasn't probably been done yet, I don't believe, but at the policy level, for instance, you know, with uh, when they're deciding on where to site new schools, you know, don't put it in egg zones or, you know, <laughs> or if you have to, <laughs> you know, better pick egg zones that have currently a lot of fallow area around it. Things like, you know, just having more coordination, more information. So, um, so that these uh, new rules can be effective implemented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure you you would appreciate um, that our our listeners don't call you directly with all their pesticide questions. Where could our ag producers and the general public with questions on pesticides in Hawaii? Where would you refer them to? Um, no matter what island they're on, what what agency, sure. what office, or what website would be useful well, for them? Well, you know, if it's specifically about pesticides, um, the the, uh, the pesticide branch of 
uh, Department of Ag, uh, you know, in each county, uh, they have an educational specialist. Um, and I've dealt with them a lot in one of my county, and they're, they're very helpful. And that's um, that is their job. Uh, you know, it, it, they're in, they're not in the enforcement branch of the pesticide division. They're, they're educational specialists because they know that that's needed. And the, yeah, they and you know sometimes when you're reading a pesticide label, so I mean these labels are, I mean some of them are just <laughs> the wording, you know, and the organization of it. It, it can be a little conf confusing. Mm -hmm. Okay can I use it in this situation or how much and all this. And uh, yeah, they, um, uh, there's on the website of uh, the pesticide division uh, that they, they have the contact information. And that'd be the first place I'd recommend asking because the, you know, if it's, it, yeah, if it's a question about using the pesticide, you know, that whatever's on that label, as the EPA says, the label is law. And uh, um, the pesticide educational specialist can help you interpret that to uh, make sure you're in compliance. Um, or just, I mean, even answering, you know, uh, you know, general questions about, well, how do you do that? You know, how do you comply with this part? Or, you know, what technique do you use to measure this? Things like that. Also, maybe your local CTAR extension agent? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's for the pesticide, you know, for general information about, uh, okay, and um, if you're considering al alternatives are using pesticides in an integrated pest management uh, program. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, CTAR has a lot of good information um, on integrated pest management. That is, uh, you know, taking it in the context of, um all all things you can do cultural practices um using uh, beneficials rotating and you know and, and and the role if any depends on the crop and the situation of uh you know pesticide use within that mm -hmm. but uh, certainly yeah the um within CTAR you know the resources within the Ag Experiment Station and the Cooperative Extension Service uh, are you know very good, and you know you know and um, can be very specific in consulting about you know your environment depending on mm -hmm. county you're in. Right, and and you brought up the IPM, the Integrated Pest Management. A lot of that is strategies and tactics in order to minimize the need for spraying anything. Right. That's right. The, yeah. the like you said, the rotation. Getting in, getting out, like don't keep a certain crop or a cultivar around for too long, right? Ch sure. Change it up. Yep. Yeah, that it's 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 there's other ways to to add tools to your arsenal so that you don't have to be spraying constantly and yeah. and, and upping the dosage or or changing right. up the whatever application or whatever uh, chemical or you know spray that you're using, whatever brand you're using, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it, within context, you know, pesticides, they're, they're a tool, they're not a solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it sh should be a tool that we're not, we're not afraid of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing, too, um, is, you know, some, sometimes, you know, as a farmer, you really want to grow something. You really want to grow uh, cabbage or you really want to grow maybe orchids or, a, a, you know, a specific type of flower. But it's not suitable for where you're located. And you just got to let go of that idea that you're going to be a cabbage farmer, right? Or you're going to be a papaya farmer in, in a certain area, right? And you, you just got to forego that. And, you know, then you're not going to be spraying so much if you're growing something that's more resilient of a crop, right? Oh, exactly. Um, yeah. You know, we, I've tried to grow many things, different elements, and they just get hammered by pests. Other things are much, you know, you know, much more bulletproof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where I live, this elevation, about 2,500 feet in Kula, in Maui, you know what? It, citrus and avocado do really well. And with fertilizer and water, they're fine. I, you know, 
I don't, I don't put anything on. You don't need to <laughs> because mm -hmm. they're in this environment. They're really well adapted. You'll get, um, you'll get pest infestations, but they're uh, temporary mm -hmm. and they don't really do um, anywhere near enough damage to, um, you know, justify, you know, even putting soap water on it. You, you know, you don't have to. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and tr trying to, you know, go against that battle. Oh man. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, that's another thing too, is just selection, right? Common sense. Um, in addition to CTAR extension agents, right, which is a valuable resource on every island. Um, how about uh, your neighborhood NRCS office, your USDA oh, yeah. office, or um, even the soil water, cons I used to be um, a soil water conservation district uh, specialist on Koi. That's my oh. first job on Koi. That's why I moved to Koi. Yeah. But, uh, they they know a little bit. They can they can also refer. Any, oh yeah. Any, any yeah. questions? Yeah, to to a specialist. Yeah, they're a valuable resource also. The, the uh, NRCS. Yeah. Yeah, they've, yeah. Uh, they've helped with a lot of things. Yeah, they were. Um, I believe NRCS was created right during as a response to the dust bowl is that yes. correct yeah so yeah, for, you know, for to come up with soil conservation um uh, uh, practices and yeah they they've done a good job uh we uh recently here in maui the dlnr gave um a five acre plot uh to doe to the uh elementary school and a group of us a group of uh, retired ag guys. Uh, we, uh, yeah, it was all in forest at the time, and we we helped convert it to an educational farm. And, That's awesome. Yeah, it, and it was very helpful to have uh, NRCS come because they would come in, look at the place, and you know show us what what places shouldn't be uh, cultivated or done anything with because too you know too steep a slope. They have their stand, you know. Um, and from their erosion programs, that, you know, they can predict what's going to happen. Um, and then they would recommend uh, certain practices, um, you know, th throughout uh, what, whether it's going to be for the um, fruit orchard, uh, uh, the animal pasture, you know, or um, uh, the gardens. And so, yeah, they, they were very helpful. I was wondering if there were any non-governmental organizations that somebody could also go to for a third party perspective on pesticides that is that that they're 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 trustworthy they're uh, certified and um it, you know because you know we live in a country of, of uh where, where people are entitled to their opinions right and sure. um you know, we, we also, part of that is also you're entitled to not trusting the government, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's part of, that's part of living in, in this, this current state of affairs in uh, the islands, the occupied kingdom of Hawaii. Um, so are there, is there a non-governmental organization that is an authority in the field of pesticides that could also be referred to? I know this question. This is this was not part of the the original questions, but I just thought of. Oh it. no, no, no! I'm trying is, to. Uh, is there another option out there that's not affiliated with the government that cannot be cannot be tied monetarily or politically uh, to a corporate interest? It, is is that Omri? What what is what is Omri? Or is Omri part of the government? Well, it's it's associated with the USA Organic mm -hmm. Program certification so yeah it's again that's tied to usda there's uh, a couple other uh, certifiers though right a couple i i've i've bought in um pesticide herbicides and insecticides that have other little logos saying that they were like certified by an organic third party you know i i'm not familiar with that I don't know. Mm. Um, in terms of another you know, unaffiliated organizations, NGOs, uh, you know, on the topic of pesticides, you know, it's pretty much, I mean, all the ones I'm familiar with, 
our um, university resources are related to ag experiment stations, cooperative extension, just because it's evidence-based research. Um, I guess, I mean, you could, I, they would recommend you the cooperative extension service, but like, for instance, Farm Bureau, mm -hmm. they are, but I mean, um, it's, it's mostly made up of ag producers, but yeah, I mean, the members of Farm Bureau, um, I guess, they, I mean, they're, they're an independent from a uh, government agency. They probably receive uh, funding from, I mean, most of it comes from the American Farm Bureau. Um, but I, yeah, you know, being, being a diehard scientist, uh, yeah, uh, you know, what, yeah, in science, the only thing that matters is evidence. And so, yes, yes. So I'm, uh, you know, so I'm, I acknowledge that I'm severely biased towards <laughs> evidence based research. And so I really, you know, outside of the experiment stations and, co and cooperative extension and scientific publications, um, yeah, and organizations affiliated with that. I, I'm not sure of um, other groups. Mm. Well, the main the main point is read the label. If you're going to use any sort of pesticide, whether it's organic or non-organic, read the label, follow the label, use common sense, wear PPE, don't spray near animals or human beings who are not wearing PPE. <laughs> Don't spray near a stream or a water source, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah. Don't don't spray on a rainy day. That's a waste of money, right? Just common sense things. That's that's a place to start. But um, yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting thing. Is may, will there if if this if the rift between um, the the general public and the public perception continues over the conversation of pesticides, will it? Will it end up being having to have a third party non government affiliated organization to step up and also conduct science and to verify right and replicate um, anyway uh, uh, yeah I, that's that's an interesting question and yeah that would be. You know, to get funding for something like that, oh boy, it's 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 uh you know it's it's all about personal choice and um, exactly. at the end of the day, if you don't trust if you don't trust the way your food is cultivated, grow it yourself, right? <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, a absolutely. The, Just grow uh, yourself. We live yes. in Hawaii, you know. Oh yeah, grow yeah. yourself. You can grow almost anything in Hawaii, and you know. Um, as everybody knows, I mean, the large majority even of um, people that are classified in farmers in Hawaii are very small, have very small re revenue from farming. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whether the, you want to consider it as backyarders, gardeners, or subsistence growers, that's great. And whatever choice they want to use, and if they're dedicated to not using pesticides, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And commercial growers who um, incorporate pesticides as part of their general IPM, you know, they have to be able to use them. Mm -hmm. and, they can, and as you say, they use it safely by following uh, the worker protection standard rules. And like you said, but the label, that those label has they have everything. It's a consolidation of all the significant information that had to be used to register that pesticide, including what wind velocities you have to pay attention to, setback distances from wellheads or water sources, um, all of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's uh, it's a matter of choice. So, and, if any, it should always be that way. Yeah. So, if anything. Um... At least for me, a big takeaway is if, if it, when it comes down to trust, where your food comes from, if you cannot trust a stranger, a professional, 
to -hmm. grow the food that you buy in the store. And if you cannot grow it yourself, then buy food from somebody who you trust. Buy food directly from a farmer that you trust, right? If that's an issue. Yeah. Support support local ag, right? Support local ag. Oh, yeah. And, you know, as you say, I mean, here in Hawaii, trusting the food, you don't know who's growing your food. Yeah, I mean, that's a big issue because 85 something percent of our food comes in Mm -hmm. from the mainland. Um, Part of this has been addressed. I mean, this issue, you know, over many years, uh, there's two big programs. One's called the uh, Pesticide Data Program. And so every year, USDA collects um, from farmers markets, from grocery stores, from all, you know, random places. They they collect hundreds and hundreds of samples of food and they analyze them for pesticide residues. And they've done this for for years and decades now. And uh, the other program is run by the Food and Drug Administration. It's called uh, uh, the Total Diet Study, where they look at, uh, you know, not just um, these samples that change in that pesticide data program. But anyway, both those programs together uh, are monitoring um, the pesticide exposure residues, you know, through food residues. And it, they consistently, uh, you know, you can look these up, these annual reports. Uh, it's, you're, you're talking about 90 for the PDT, for the pesticide data program, consistently every year over 99% of the uh, food that they test um, is well below um, any health concern level for pesticide residues. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's 99.5 and, and the total diet study, it's a little bit uh, less like 96, 97%. Mm-hmm. And on like half of them, they can't find any residue, which is rather amazing because our capabilities to detect uh, molecules now with gas chromatography and uh, mass spectrometry are just amazing. So does, does uh, that that total study include meat as well, like beef, pork, chicken, or is the, it just it's just? Produce? I believe that the, the total diet study does. I I think the pesticide data program is more on fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's all available online, and that. Um, is that's probably the best information out there about our exposure in the general, uh, um, you know, in the general food supply. Mm. So um, this is a great conversation. Uh, before, I, I'd like to step back um, next and, and talk about a little bit more bigger picture things, but is there anything else you'd like to share about the topic of pesticides or specifically pesticides in the state of Hawaii across the Paiaina in Hawaii, um, based on your experience, based on the general conversation going on in the public and public perception, um, where, what, what's next? Like, what, what, what can we do next to, to raise the bar, to level up here? <laughs> well, I, it's easy to say, well, you know, just get informed and get educated. But um, I think probably the biggest um, I mean, probably the best single thing, uh, even if you're not a producer, is look at the uh, worker protection standard that EPA has come out with. Because it, uh, it's really comprehensive in its safety requirements. Um, People got to uh, read. They got to read. Right? Oh, if, if you want to know, you got to read. But okay, but they've made it. They've made it simple. You can watch two videos. <laughs> oh, there's, there's video. Okay, um, if I'll, I'll I'll get the links for from you, and I'll put that in the description. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. If, if if we can have those video, I'll I'll have a link. That's the cool thing about technology. We'll post this on YouTube, and I'll I'll put it in the in the description for the podcast those links. So. Yeah, that pesticide educational. Um, I forget the consortium uh they they put together all those resources yeah they have the uh, the training videos for uh because there, there's one for ag workers you know who don't handle things and another one for uh handlers and applicators awesome. and you can see how extensive uh the safety measures are the information measures uh, yeah 
That sounds good. So we'll include that one for everybody, for everybody's edification. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably, um, yeah, if you don't want to read a bunch of long summaries and documents, that's, uh, I think, um, it's very uh, informational, yeah. All right, mahalo for that. Um, so now I'd like to step back. Like the the overall purpose of the Seeds of Wellbeing podcast is to provide knowledge, but also um, a bit of support, encouragement, advice, and manao for ag producers across the state of Hawaii. And um, you know, based on our study, we've we've found that. A lot of our agricultural producers in Hawaii are stressed out. Um, a lot are dealing with uh, depression because of the difficulties, the uncertainty, the high risk, the low return on investment, um, the small profit margin, all those things that come along with farming um, as an occupation and as a lifestyle. And, you know, we talk about food security and sustainability and uh, gentrification, development, economic viability, um, all these things kind of go hand in hand in this very complex conversation. So I'd like to step back from just talking about pesticides and just kind of pick your brain about your experience working in the ag industry um, in Hawaii, but also specifically on Maui. And so uh, my next question to you, Dr. Kaiser, is how did you originally become involved in agriculture in Hawaii? Well, how did I be? Um, I, I came to Hawaii about 34 years ago. I'd been working um, for the USDA in their agriculture, um, agricultural research service um, as a soil microbiologist. And I kept getting um, uh, through, uh, you know, affiliation with colleagues, uh, invitations to apply to the University of Hawaii. Okay, so finally did, <laughs> and uh, you know, worked on uh, legumes and nitrogen fixation, um, and then uh, the last ten years, uh, I went to the dark side. I became an administrator, <laughs> right, and uh, and that's like like I said when I, when I was uh, administrator, you have very specific duties, but they they give you like generally like a leeway like 20% of your time for you to decide where to focus on what the needs are in your county. And like I said, um, you know, the mayor initially uh, approached me about, you know, providing some evidence-based research to help um, on some very contentious topics. Um, and um, then um, in my role, also as county administrator, of course, uh, and through connections, you know, you meet a lot of producers, uh, animal, veg, you know, fruit producers, you know, become very familiar with everybody. Um, and um, about when I retired, that was in 2012, uh, my son and his business partner uh, had started um, Wholesale Nursery. And they were selling native plants, native Hawaiian plants. Uh, to DLNR um, and Division of Forestry and the NARS system statewide. Um, and that, uh, that business expanded. And um, when I retired, I started helping them out. And then when these mandatory rules came uh, for the worker protection standard came up, um, uh, I became responsible for the coordinator for that at the nursery. Um, and, and, you know, we uh, would, you know, in certain situations, we had to apply pesticides because, you know, you're sending out, you know, okia and koa and all these native plants all over. And you, you can't have them being sent out, you know, with diseases and slugs or anything on them. You know, you don't want to do that. That's been a big problem in California that native plant nurseries were sending out, you know, uh, native California plants that were infected with phytophthora root rot, mm -hmm. to, you know, to the forest. Yeah, yeah. Things like that. A anyway, um, and then when the worker protection standards came along, that required a lot more 
uh, effort, which um, I took care of. And then pretty soon, I think just because of state funding, whatever, it was hard to get anybody to come train because your workers have to be trained yearly that under, under that uh, worker protection standard. So uh, finally, uh, EPA approved uh, a course, uh, I could train the trainers course, uh, which I completed. And so I was able to do that um, for our, uh, for the nursery and then, and also for some other uh, commercial entities, uh, other egg producers on Maui. That sounds like a very lucrative position or job in the ag industry. Is that EPA uh, uh, certified? It, it, yeah, but you know, it's, um, they only have to do it once a year, <laughs> you know, each, each uh, producer. But I mean, th there's definitely a need for it because uh, HDOA just can't, they can't do it all. Uh, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is satisfying because it's, um, you know, people really, they really like understanding, especially the personal environmental safety aspects of it. Um, and uh, I also, and then the, the same thing I applied uh, recently with um, the Department of Transportation uh, roadside management uh, workers uh, mm. on all the islands, training them in uh, pesticide use and safety. So yeah, that's, so I really, um, the most extensive part of my familiarity with agriculture has been, yeah, through my son's nursery. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, so you've been, you've been in Hawaii for over 30 years and working specifically in agriculture. What challenges have you experienced and observed while working with ag producers in Hawaii? Well, like what, what, pa what patterns do you see coming up over and over again where local ag producers continue to struggle and run into the same challenges, the same problems? Well, I, I think it's pro probably the most, uh, most common one, recurring one um, is, you know, how do you compete with lower cost of production food that's coming, a lower cost of production um, materials mm -hmm. that's coming from the mainland? Yeah, or the third world, right? Oh yeah, exactly. Because we South all South America, Central America. Because the cost of land, labor, and water here, and that the recent University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization um, paper on um, revitalizing ag in Hawaii. I mean, they noted that on average, that the input costs here are about you know there's a forty percent premium on it by the time it gets here and delivered. I mean, we see that at the nursery all the time. Yeah, I mean, just, so the cost and um, that's, I, to me, the, the biggest issue is, stay, is staying profitable in a really challenging mm -hmm. environment. Um, I will say, I, th I think that uh, my recommendation from looking at this is that, um, you, you know, what's really worked have been the agricultural parks. Um, there's state agricultural parks and a, a couple of counties have their own. And they've worked, they're in high, high demand and we have a lot of uh, fallow agricultural land. And put it, you know, at ADC, Ag Development Corporation, they have a lot of land. Putting more of that, making it available. Like here in Maui County, um, the ag park, you can get, I, I'm not sure if you can get the 50 year, I mean the uh, 50 acre lease anymore, but you can get 10, 20 acres, 50 year lease. It may be longer than that now. Um, for a very reasonable, uh, when I was on the board, it was like $100, $150 per acre per year. But you, you could, like I said, you could get, you know, as, as long as you would have to write a farm plan. Mm -hmm to show that you knew what you wanted to do and were, um, you had reasonable expectations of being successful and done your market research. Um, but you, you can get long-term liability of peace and a water meter came with that. Mm -hmm. And those- That's important, the water. 
and those are two and uh, you know here in Maui County now they've um, they've about doubled um, they've purchased more land and they're gonna um, the the new director um, wants to make the second egg park dedicated to organic production mm. and so I think things like that have the, these egg parks because uh, for people that both want to get into it and existing producers you know say they're they're leasing from uh, uh they have a year to year lease mm -hmm. somewhere and they they're a little bit reluctant to put in more yeah, capital that's, that's difficult yeah i mean farming is slow roi it's it's a long-term investment and i mean even even as a tent just a regular tenant in you know a rental for a house for residents or an apartment like year to year that causes yeah. stress right to me like oh Absolutely. I don't know if I got to pack up all my belongings and move and, you know, find somewhere else next year. Or, um, but yeah, farming, especially like investing all your time and energy and money into, you know, making the soils better, uh, increasing organic matter in, in the topsoil. Like you can't just pick that all up and take it with you to the next farm. <laughs> yeah. No. And th that's why I think, like I said, the, you have the ag parks. Um, how are there? I mean, even if there's private ones, I mean, there, there's enough land. Um, and, you know, I think it's a matter of uh, will among um, local politicians. I mean, uh, it, it would really help to expand it because it, it's really worked. Right. And uh, there's demand for more of them. And, and, the, and even, um, you know, uh, for, for people maybe who aren't uh, ag producers but want to grow more of their own food. The county providing land for um, you know garden allotments, mm -hmm. you know five hundred thousand square foot um, gardening allotments. For people who live in Ohana's or you know, apartments that don't have ag but want to grow some of their own food. Um, I think that I think that would be uh, helpful, or it could be you know structured properly. Allotments. That's the new. That's a new keyword right there. Allotments. I've heard that term used in. I think the UK. Um, they give they give allotments out to people who are going to seriously garden or farm, right? Oh yeah, my uh, my brother in law lives in uh, in Leeds in, in Yorkshire, and um, he has a big allotment, and mm -hmm. uh, he grows a lot of his own food. Yeah. I, I guess in order to step back from, in order to give a little context for why this the the ag park is a viable solution is because we're in the wake of the plantation era right which was massive scale like large scale farming monocropping um planting you know multiple multiple uh acres thousands of acres uh plantation workers which is you know one step above slavery right <laughs> um and there was no coordinated effort to fill all of that land, once once you know everyone got unionized and the pr the price of production went up and the profit margin went down and you know the competition from the third world and from the mainland killed a lot of the industry out here. Um, what do we do with all that land and how can we uh, effectively break it up into smaller chunks that are workable and where people don't blow their load financially and give up and quit and then then you know it's just a cycle of just people starting up and then quitting and then someone else another newbie starts up and then quits and the ag park might you know that might be that connecting piece right so i think it, it can certainly help i mean those those bigger questions you just uh or as, aspects of it that you mentioned yeah those yeah, that's policy decision. I mean, as, as I mentioned, there's a lot, there's a lot of fellow land available. And there's a lot of land in the Ag Development Corporation uh, that uh, is supposed to help uh, you know, revitalize Ag in Hawaii. It's just, you know, I mean, I, it's, I'm preaching the choir, but it's, <laughs> It's it's tough. It, it it hasn't been solved in quite a while. You know, uh, when the, the plantation arrows you know went out, 
I mean, some of the land um, as the, uh, you know, seed companies took some, but um, there hasn't been a lot of big scale. And, you know, that, I think there's like 100,000 acres of fallow land that was formerly still, you know, in sugarcane and pineapple that hasn't been put to use. So and we need more farmers. We need more no, able-bodied people who have yeah, the consistency it, and the, the discipline and the willpower to show up every day and keep plants and animals alive. Yeah, I mean, th there's, you know, there's programs to help towards that, like Go Farm Hawaii uh, and, you know, internships. And, and those are all great. It's, it's um, a boy putting it into uh, consolidating it and making a viable business. You know, you've mm -hmm. really got, it's got to be a, almost a niche market. Mm -hmm. You really got to do your homework. Uh -huh. And yeah, I mean, it's a, it's one of the most expensive places in the world to farm. <laughs> It is. It is. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't farm anywhere else, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, and and on the, the other side, you know, for, for people's own uh, food security and sustainability, um, you know, I think, you know, the allotments are, are small scale uh, ag park allotments uh, can work. Maybe even county park allotments. There's a lot of county parks on Koi where oh. it's just a grassy field, you know, and there's no um, program uh, coordination. There's no programming. So it's just, you know, it's a nice big lawn that is mowed every once in a while. <laughs> Those can definitely be transformed into public gardens and public parks, I believe, that, you know, yeah, things like that. You can get behind. Mm -hmm. So, um, final question. Do you have any additional thoughts, opinions, advice about the bigger picture, about the current status of agriculture in the state of Hawaii and how it can be improved upon in terms of economic viability? We're talking about how expensive it is to farm out here. Um, any thoughts on sustainability and this whole, you know, sustainability is a hot, a hot word right now, you know, maybe even overused, but Sustainability and the, the other important term is food security, food security, which which came definitely got a lot of attention during COVID is the importance mm -hmm. of us being able to not rely on food being imported like us, us here, us residents here mm -hmm. in in Hawaii, mm -hmm. being able to, you know, fall back and, and have some reassurance that we can we can grow enough food locally to sustain ourselves so we don't mm -hmm. all starve if there was a massive uh, disruption in the supply chain coming in from the mainland or from other countries. Okay. Well, um, yeah, in, ter in terms of uh, that, in, ter in ter terms of food security, I think there's more potential to improve that because there's a lot of resources on, uh, you know, on everything from how, you know, how the early Hawaiians did it um, and has been added to since then. Um, and that, that can be done individually, whether it's in your backyard uh, or some of these things we've talked about, uh, garden plots, uh, allotments, small. Um, and, you know, taking advantage, there, there, there's a lot of good information there and uh, some of the uh, county and state resources being made available um uh can can really help food security because we, you know we can't uh we can grow things you know year round mm -hmm. um and I, I mentioned the uh old CTAR publication um called home gardening in hawaii that's put out in 1943 right and that was for uh, these victory gardens and that that was put out because the uh, Department of Defense said they were going to use more and more of the cargo space coming to Hawaii um, for defense materials going to Pearl Harbor, and that they weren't going to be shipping in enough food, and they thought people in Hawaii should be able to grow more food. So they turned to CTAR. And anyway, you know, there's a lot of great information about, depending on your elevation and which side of the island you are, how to go about growing food. 
uh, for, for a family of four on average, you know, spacing of the, you know, of your rows, uh, frequency, you know, how many weeks apart you had to say like plant cabbage, you have a constant supply, you know, and what the processes were to do that. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, not 1943 style information, but the equivalent today, you know, um, of, for that. that sounds can, like it's time for an update. It sounds like it's time for a CTAR no, update the, of the modern day Victory Garden. We were thinking about that, and um, yeah, then then I looked at the pesticide chapter and thought, okay, yeah, <laughs> we we got you with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, there's I, I think for food security, I think there's um, I, my opinion, there's more potential to make progress in that. Uh, then and I you know I'm not dismissing or anything, but I mean I think there's more potential to make progress on that front than on uh, revitalizing uh, commercial agriculture in a big way. I think mm -hmm. that's going to be generational you know, change. Yeah. So um, yeah, that that's in in terms of that agriculture is a lifestyle. It's it's not just an occupation. It's not just a job. It's a lifestyle. And um, yeah, the idea is if everybody, every family has a green thumb, yeah. that will raise the bar for all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I used to hear certain uh, old timers grumble that, you know, oh, the, 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 these farmers are, you know, it, it's a lifestyle for them. It's not about, you know, business or profits. And I think we have to understand that there's that whole spectrum, <laughs> but mm -hmm. certainly for food security as, as part of our lifestyle, oh, it, there's definitely room mm -hmm. to increase that for sure. Yeah, so, and, and I think also um, my message to the general public, to consumers who eat food, uh, you vote with your dollars, yes. where, where you buy your, your food, you know, who you choose to buy from, um, the whole try buy local campaign, that, that does make a difference, you know. That that money stays in the islands when you buy from a local producer, a local farmer. Sure, it stays in the islands. Versus if you buy food, you know, that's imported. That that money gets up and it flies away, and it doesn't necessarily come back ever. Yeah. So it, you know, uh, little things, little things count too, right? Even if oh, it's absolutely. just lifestyle changes. Yeah, yeah, and and there are there's there's a lot of people. Who have a lot of knowledge and experience, you know, from the life from their lifestyle, incorporating food production in it, that we can learn from for sure. Well, on that note, I'd like to say mahalo, nui lo, for your time and for your your uh, knowledge and expertise. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure talking with you. Well, thank you, Alex. I I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Aloha. Okay, aloha. We want to thank our guests for their generosity and mana'o. We also want to thank all our ag producers throughout the islands, and especially those we have heard on the podcast for discussing ways they address the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual dimensions of Hawaii ag production. Each story, each voice contributes to a broader understanding of what it takes to survive and thrive as we feed our communities. Wherever you may find yourself within our island agriculture economies, if you would like to share your story in our podcast, please contact us. Thank you for listening to the Seeds of Wellbeing, Voices from the Field podcast featuring their perspectives of ag producers throughout the Hawaii Islands. If you have found it helpful, please follow, like, and share this episode with others. And if you have any ideas about how we can make it better, please let us know in the comments or use the link on our website. Mahalo for tuning in. The intention of these podcast series is to create a safe space for a respectful and inclusive dialogue with people from across a broad and diverse spectrum involved in growing and making accessible the food we share together.
A diversity of voices, perspectives, and experiences can serve to deepen mutual understanding, to spark creative problem solving, and provide insight into the complexities of our agricultural system. If you, our listeners, have experiences with Hawaii agriculture ecosystem from indigenous methods, permaculture, smallholder farmers, to large, including multinational agricultural industrial companies, and everywhere in between, and you would like to share your story, please contact us. We welcome your voices and perspectives.